Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, San Francisco's premier author interview program. Today we have a novel to talk about with a very simple title, but to me is a, is a kind of complicated piece of business. The title of the book is The Keep. The author is Jennifer Egan and the publisher is Alfred A. Knopf. Thank you for coming by. Thank you for inviting me. The uh, You've written a number of books. Uh, a book called Look at Me several years back was a National Book Awards finalist. And uh, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> we're going to talk about The Keep, which is ostensibly a, a tale of a Gothic castle somewhere in Central Europe. Sounds an awful lot like Czechoslovakia, but we're really not sure. And this book was inspired by a trip that you and the family took to Godfrey de Bouillon. Is that the way you say that? Yes, I believe Godfrey so. Godfrey de Bouillon's castle in Belgium. What were you doing over there? Well, my husband had a directing job. He directs plays in uh, in France, actually, in Charleville, which is near the Belgian border. And so when we had a free day, we, we rented a car and we drove to Bouillon. With child. With a an eight week old baby, eight week old baby, <laughs> who hung in a pouch doing not much. This is called guts. <laughs> it also sounds like a character in the book, doesn't it? Well, we'll get to that later. There's a baby being carried around. Yeah, well, this is true. All right, that's what happens. And the the interesting thing, or one interesting thing, about this particular castle and this gentleman is that he was very much involved with the First Crusade. And the First Crusade was launched from there. That That is what I learned during my visit to Bouillon. I had not known it before. Uh, and the castle is a ruin, but we, we hiked up the hill and went inside, and, it's, and it looks down at a plunging view of the town, and uh, I found myself extremely enthralled being there for reasons that I didn't understand. And uh, But I have learned to know that there's a certain kind of enthrallment, I feel, because I know that I'm going to use a place in uh-huh. some way in, in fiction. That, 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 that must be a great feeling, you know. It is so I mean, it's, this is really wonderful, and yet there's going to be something beyond this. That's going and to be really wonderful. And it's really wonderful because there's something beyond it. Yeah. It's, a very, it's, a, it's a great sense of anticipation. It's, it's wonderful. I feel lucky. And uh, it took me a while to figure out exactly what that something waiting out there for me was, because I thought maybe I wanted to write a novel set in medieval times, but that didn't really seem like it. Uh, so I, I mulled it over for a while and realized that I, it was really a gothic feeling that I was mm-hmm. interested in. Mm-hmm. And I had never written anything like that before. So it was it was really a fun change. And what, and what we get out of it, I think, in, in a sense at least, are, are two stories. And uh, perhaps Ray's and Danny's, we could identify them, but maybe not. I don't know. But... Uh, the important thing is that this is a beautifully crafted, totally integrated whole that comes out of these two stories that, in in my case, just swallowed me up. Well, thank you. That's definitely my goal. <laughs> I like to get tired calls early in the morning from people who have lost sleep. <laughs> That's my favorite kind of phone call. Now, this this is a, a, a novel that, that spills over with, with uh, ideas and, and plot and so on. And, and it also spills over with, with characters. I, I must credit this list to Elle magazine, the August 2006 issue, where uh, the the writer says, The novel's multi-layered, time-shifting narrative is populated by cons, ex-cons, writing teachers, harried parents, precocious children, self-destructive teens, and even a damsel actually a baroness, good for that correction, who imperiously occupies the dilapidated keep, all of whose lives intersect and collide in the book's feverishly placed pyrotechnic prose. We've never had anybody here with pyrotechnic prose before. <laughs> Some of your subject subjects might disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think I'm the first. <laughs> but really, it's as though you really opened up here and, and let a lot of folks in and, and, as it says, kind of mix them together and all kinds of uh, interesting things uh, start to happen. Now, the, the Keep, I think, has what you would call modern concerns. One of the main characters, Danny, for example, when he gets over to where the castle is, loses his dish in in the stinking swimming pool. 
And now he would be without what he calls the flow of communication that he needs the way most of us need to move or breathe. It's true. Well, what's of, he representing here? Pray um, tell. Well, nothing to do with me, of course. <laughs> um, one of the things that interested me right from the beginning about this the Gothic atmosphere was the way in which it's usually cut off from the so-called real world. I mean, if yes, you think of yes. classic Gothic tales, they they usually involve a, a, a kind of descent into a realm that is separate from real life. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I love the idea of having that cut off atmosphere collide with modern telecommunications and see which would win. Well, the Keep combines cell phones and satellites with castles, secret passages, and scary tunnels. Can you do that? We'll find out when we return. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Jennifer Egan is the author, The Keep is a novel. That's the title. The Keep. The publisher is Alfred Knopp. And several weeks ago, months ago now, my goodness, time flies, the New York Times Book Review uh, took care of this book with a front page review. Not only was it a front page review, but it was very imaginatively illustrated with what I would call Escher-like things. It was really wonderful. And the title of the uh, uh, the review is Into the Labyrinth. And at some point in there, uh, the uh, reviewer, uh, Madison Smart Bell, says that Egan sustains an awareness that the text is being manipulated by its author, while at the same time delivering character and story with perfect and passionate conviction. Well, that's that pyrotechnic stuff. Very few writers of our time or any other have been able to bring that combination off. And uh, he writes later about impressive, but more impressive than her craftsmanship, he says, is the emotional authenticity she achieves, something almost no other metafictionist has ever delivered. I need to ask you, are you a metafictionist? (laughs) And if you are, what is it? Well, um, I don't... See, these are things I, I, I think are off-putting. I mean, the point that he's making is, is you know, it, it's kind of saying that what you've done here is make things exciting and accessible, and then he accuses you of being a metafictionist, which, I mean, you may be liable. I know, it's a frightening thought. Um <laughs> Metafiction, I think it is metafiction, this book, but I, it is not a term that, that warms my heart very much. Why uh, not? Well, it just sounds academic and not very exciting as a term. But what it means is just that one thing that the book is about is itself being written. And that is, in fact, true in this case, because yeah. the central yeah. castle story is one thread of the narrative. And what surrounds that is a prison writing class in which the castle story is being written. And so, in fact, it is a book about itself being written. But what you're reading for is not some idea of metafiction, but hopefully a story that pulls you in and excites you and is working on two different levels. And also, I think, challenges you around the issue of what's real and what's not real, what's real and what's invented, uh, what uh, what's going on in some other place. And uh, or you say in another in another interview that you had that this whole business of the distinction between the real and the unreal may be becoming irrelevant because uh, now our experience, so much of our experience, you said, is disembodied. It, in, in a sense, uh, we live in an imaginary world. Well, that's true in the sense that when you look at the part of our lives that happens through telecommunication, all the mediated experience that we have via the Internet or the cell phone, we are, in fact, uh, you know, we are having experiences that are not happening in the way that we traditionally think of experiences as happening. Um, In other words, the people and the and the and the things are not actually there. Uh, And what interested me about that is is especially in a gothic environment the central question of gothic fiction is always is often i should say 
are these apparitions real right. or not? Yeah, yeah. Does is this passage, you know, really a secret passage, or is it just the guy can't find his way out of a paper bag? Or are these strange figures I see moving around on the landscape? If you think of, say, Turn of the Screw, um, are these are these ghosts, or is this some kind of projection of an inner state onto the landscape? Is, in other words, is the person seeing them a little crazy, mm. or are they real? In quotes, and crazy. And so I, I like the idea of, of uh, bringing technology into that environment because while they seem to have nothing in common, the cutoff Gothic with, the, with telecommunications, in this way they actually have a great big thing in common. They both raise the same question. Hmm. One of the uh, issues that comes up on and off during the book is the issue of power. Now, one of the persons at the start of the book who has power is, is Howard. And one of the people who wants power is Danny, and who probably has some power, but not as much as Danny. And he, Danny, feels that the reason that, that he doesn't have the power he really wants is something called the worm. It's something that gets inside you, and it starts to eat, and it doesn't stop until there's nothing left. And then you see yourself as weak and powerless, and it was only a matter of time before everyone would agree that you are weak and powerless. Well, Danny's approach to power it has been uh, making him, giving himself a lot of access to powerful people and rubbing up against them and hoping that somehow by, that by, will... by being what he calls the number two. Right. Yeah. He has proximity to power, and he hopes that that will lead to actual power. And in a way, the worm is his own horrified recognition that access to power and connection and uh, you know being near important people does not make you important so his world feels like it crumbles when he when he's aware of that the keep is a lot of things gothic tale a thriller metafiction and a novel with some powerful writing this point we're going to prove very soon you're listening to conversations on the coast with jim foster follow us on twitter at jim foster coc or send an email to jim foster coc at gmail.com this is Jim Foster. Our novel today is The Keep by Jennifer Egan, published by Alfred A. Knopp. And uh, a magazine I've never quoted from before, The Oprah Magazine, has some wonderful things to say about this book. Notably, as you finish this novel, part horror tale, part mystery, here we go again, all the many parts, part romance, they would have to say that. The mind lingers over it, amazed by how vivid Egan has made it, how witty, how disturbing, how credible, and yet how utterly fantastic. Well, when you've finished it, you're going to really regret uh, putting it down because you're, you're, you're going to remember so many passages. And the interesting thing about this book, from your perspective as an author, or one of the interesting things, is that... You're writing here in what you call a change in voice. No lyricism. Your voice in this book would never try to say anything beautifully. The speech would be vernacular. And any beauty would have to come about by accident. And I want you in this segment to read us an accident. This is an accident that takes place in an ICU. And it's between two people. The uh, Ray and his uh, teacher, Holly, you're on. Ray, she says, and leans closer to me. I, I keep wondering about what happened. You mean with Tom Tom? No, before, why you went to prison. Oh, that. I want to understand it. I don't understand it. Then the facts, if you can talk about it, it, it would help me, I think. I wait a while before I answer. Finally, I say... The facts are, I shot a guy through the head. She swallows. Did you know him? We were friends. She looks down at her hands. I keep my eyes on her, not because I want to see her reaction. I don't want that. But even more, I don't want to miss a second of her time in here next to me. I want to memorize it. I'm assuming you had a reason, she says. I had plenty of reasons, too many reasons. I could make up a lot of shit so it would sound better, but I'm too sick. It's just something I did. Holly chews that over for quite a while. 
Finally, she says, I don't like thinking things can happen that way. It makes the world seem too dangerous. Love those kids, I tell her. She looks up. I've caught her by surprise. Her face opens up, and all of a sudden, it's like that paper mask is transparent. I'm looking right through it, and I get a flash of some kind of life we could have had. Barbecues, dogs, kids flopping over us in bed. It rolls through me fast, but strong and clear, like one of those cooking smells that blows in the window so sharp you can pick out the ingredients. And then it's gone. It's gone, and Holly's holding my hand. Finally, after that long, long wait, her hand is back on mine. Dry, cool fingers, slim, the rings loose. I close my eyes. My hand is so hot, I feel my pulse in every finger. I'm afraid she'll let go, but she doesn't let go. She keeps her hand around mine, and it's like she's holding all of me in her cool sweetness, calming my fever back down. When I open up my eyes, Holly's crying. The paper mask is all wet. Something bad happened to you, I say, didn't it? She nods. The tears keep coming. It takes me about as much energy to lift up my head as it took Davis to do his 700 push-ups, but I force myself. I want to see our hands. And there they are, intertwined on my chest like two people lying down. Beyond them is the tube, black, brown plastic. My neck is shaking. I let my head fall back. The gray is coming on. All that head lifting has close to knocked me out. I hear Holly sob, and I hold her hand tighter, afraid she'll move it away. But she uses the other hand to wipe her face. And I know why they let her in here. Wow. Wow. What a great accident. This is a love scene between two people, one a teacher, the other a prisoner, before this visit to the ICU, they have never been able to touch. And you caught it. You caught it. It is just absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much. And as much as I like that, I still worry about you because you keep leaving me with the question, can the imagined become reality? And at the end of the book, the teacher goes to the keep because that's what he had written about. And of course, he's not there. She calls out his name time and time again. He doesn't respond. She's by the pool. She puts on a bathing suit and she dives in. We don't know what will happen because that's the end of the keep. But I'm still stuck with my question. Can the imagined become the reality? Well, I always think that the job of a novel is to raise questions rather than answer them, but I will pose an <laughs> answer sorry. to that one, which is that I think, you know, our imagination is what helps to create our experience for us. And if we experience it as real, who's to say it's not? In other words, what other standard can we use? We experience reality through our minds, and that is what is real to us. So the answer is yes. Good. I love to end on a positive note. We've been talking to Jennifer Egan about her new novel called The Keep. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.